In today's lecture, we'll be talking about three different genera, including one which has made a comeback as an important pathogen of pigs since the late 2000s. Our three genera today, Brachyspira, Lawsonia, and Treponema, are all biocontainment level two organisms. Lothonia intracellularis, as the name suggests, is an intracellular parasite, and it's actually an obligate intracellular parasite. So it doesn't grow outside of eukaryotic cells, and therefore we can't propagate it in the lab outside of cell culture. Brachyspira species are aerotolerant anaerobes, and while we certainly can grow them in the lab, they're somewhat atypical in that they don't tend to form colonies on solid media. And then finally, Treponema species, these are closely related to Brachyspira, have similar growth requirements, and for the veterinary species at least, similar characteristics. In these three images here, you can see some Brachyspira organisms. In the first picture, we have a gram stain of a pure culture of Brachyspira, and you can see these gram-negative uh, spirochetes. In the central image, we have a very zoomed-in picture of a, a black and white gram stain. Um, of a fecal smear containing Brachyspira. So you can see many different bacteria within the fecal microbial community, and then some Brachyspira as well. And then finally on the right, we have an image taken uh, when doing phase contrast microscopy. So this is a, a technique that we can use to visualize wet mounts, to see the organisms squiggling around um, on the microscope, making them really easy to identify. I mentioned that Brachyspira typically do not produce colonies on solid media, and in these three plates I think you can appreciate that. Um, they're also really notable for their production of hemolysins, and these hemolysins are variably active and different species of bacteria uh, produce varying degrees of hemolysis. So we can see very strong beta hemolysis on the left, sort of an intermediate hemolysis in the center, and then a very weakly uh, beta hemolytic strain on the right. Classically, we've described our Brachyspira species based on the strength of the hemolysis, but this relationship really doesn't um, associate perfectly with phylogeny. Our Brachyspira are motile, and on these electron micrographs, what you can see are the flagella that these organisms possess. These are periplasmic flagella, so they're within that outer membrane, and they allow the organism to squiggle around and move purposefully throughout its environment. These images were actually captured during a study of a novel and emerging Brachyspira species. It's been previously reported that the number of flagella possessed is characteristic to a given Brachyspira species. This is one of my favorite electron micrographs that I had the opportunity to take. This is a Brachyspira organism which is infected with phage. So you can see here we have our, our flagella. Our cell is very abnormally shaped. It gets very, very fat away from the end. Um, and what you can see are all of these little bacteriophages attacking the surface and replicating within. Um, we think that this may have been associated with some of the difficulty we had in culturing these organisms. When the cultures become stressed, the phage enter their lytic cycle, kill all the organisms, um, making propagation of cultures of these bacteria difficult. Lawsonia intracellularis is an obligate intracellular parasite, as I mentioned, and it's found within the enterocytes of host species, so within those intestinal epithelial cells. Brachyspira species are found in the gastrointestinal tract of many different animals, um, domestic and wild birds, pigs, rodents, dogs, and even people as well. And then the treponema, which we're going to briefly discuss at the end of the lecture, uh, is primarily a pathogen of the ruminant foot. We have nine species of Brachyspira that are currently recognized. These organisms used to be included within the genus Treponema, so if you're looking at old literature, be aware of that. Treponema has 28 species, and then Lawsonia, we only have one, and that is Lawsonia intracellularis. For our Brachyspiras, I mentioned that we historically have grouped them based on the strength of their hemolysis. So Brachyspira hyodysenteriae and Hampsoni were considered strongly beta hemolytic species, while all of our other species were generally weak betas, uh, Pilosicoli being the most uh, clinically relevant one. 
In reality, the identification of these organisms requires testing using molecular techniques, so PCR-based assays with or without DNA sequencing to differentiate one species from another. In the last 15 years or so, we've seen the emergence of a new species of Brachyspira, um, known as Brachyspira hampsoni. And here on the left, you can just see some image, images, some electron micrographs of different strains of Brachyspira hampsoni. And on the right, what you can see is a phylogenetic tree uh, based on the NOx gene, the NADH oxygenase gene. Um, here you can see clade 1 and clade 2 are different uh, groups of Brachyspira hampsoni. And then above, we have all of our other recognized Brachyspira species. So you can see just how different these new clades are from those which have been previously recognized, sort of lending evidence to the uh, supposition that this is, in fact, a novel species. When it comes to virulence factors, we really don't know a lot about Lassonia intracellularis. Um, it produces type 3 secretion systems, but other than that, very little is known. We've seen a lot of speculation about the virulence factors associated with Brachyspira. These are really poorly defined, and we lack experimental evidence documenting their role in disease. These are motile organisms, so they have flagella that allow them to move around. They're chemotactic and seem to be attracted to mucus. And then hemolysins have long been speculated to be involved in virulence. I've put a link to a video above where you can see Brachyspira moving on a live wet mount. Um, you can see the snake-like motility that it has and how nicely it really stands out when viewed microscopically. As far as the diseases that we see with these organisms, for Lawsonia, it's all enteric disease. Um, in both pigs and horses, we see proliferative enteropathy. In hamsters, it also causes an enteritis, colloquially known as wet tail for the diarrhea that it causes. Brachyspira hyodysenteriae and hampsoni cause an indistinguishable syndrome that we call swine dysentery in pigs. Callosa coli causes spiroketal colitis in pigs, which is a somewhat milder form. And in people, it's also been associated with intestinal infections, and it's described as intestinal spirochetosis. In birds, various species are associated with avian intestinal spirochetosis, including Pelosa coli. And then finally, Treponema species uh, cause digital dermatitis in cattle. So starting off with Lawsonia and intracellularis, um, this is the cause of proliferative enteritis, and really we're talking about ileitis, so that distal section of the small intestine. What we see is corrugation of the mucosa. This is really the unifying lesion associated with all Lawsonia infections. There's multiple forms of disease recognized, um, from intestinal adenomatosis, where we see hyperplasia of the crypt epithelium, Necrotic enteritis, which is a more chronic disease where we see necrosis of the mucosal tissues. Regional ileitis, which is a chronic disease associated with thickening of the muscularis layer. And proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy, which can really resemble swine dysentery. In these images here, you can see the ileums from some pigs affected with Lawsonia intracellularis. So on the left, we have uh, on the bottom an, a normal ileum. And above, the very, very thickened and proliferative ileal lesions that we associate with Lawsonia infections. On the right, you can see the ileum from the serosal surface. So this corrugation and thickening of the tissues is really visible even from the outside. In this image here, you can see necrotic enteritis associated with Lawsonia infections. So these necrotizing sort of... Uh, perhaps fibrinous, friable lesions all over the mucosal surface of the ileum. Lawsonia intracellularis is also increasingly recognized in horses as a cause of proliferative enteropathy. It most commonly occurs in weanling foals between about four to six months old, and clinical signs include weight loss, diarrhea, and colitis. At this stage, we don't know whether the pig and the horse strains are the same or if there are some species-specific uh, strain preferences. Just like Lawsonia intracellularis in pigs, um, in horses, it's thought to be transmitted by the fecal oral route. In this image here, you can see some granulomatous and proliferative enteritis caused by Lawsonia intracellularis in a horse. And I think you can appreciate just how um, thickened these tissues are as compared to what they would normally be, as well as the hyperemia and excess mucus production that's uh, visible within the lumen. In hamsters, Lawsonia intracellularis is a cause of wet tail, 
Um, clinical signs include diarrhea and dehydration, anorexia, and potentially also death. In large colonies, we can see devastating uh, outbreaks. Um, and we're more likely to see these infections in larger populations, so in breeding colonies or pet stores, rather than individually owned animals. These infections are most often seen in weanlings, which are between three to eight weeks old. And in order to treat these infections, we need antimicrobials and aggressive rehydration. Because this organism is spread via the fecal oral route, it's important to isolate affected animals. Mm -hmm.